Chicago Bulls and the Utah Jazz. And for more on these two clubs, let's check in with the Dean, Ahmad Rashad. All right, thanks, Marv. At 3.30 this morning, Michael Jordan woke up with flu-like symptoms. He had a stomach ache and a headache, and he couldn't go back to sleep. He threw up all night, and as reported earlier, he missed the shoot-around. But he was in bed all day and continued to throw up. All right, thanks, Ahmad. In the summer of 1997, a ball boy from Utah sat in a dark locker room with the biggest superstar in sports. On the brink of one of the most pivotal games of his career, Michael Jordan was as sick as a dog, and Preston Truman, an ordinary teenager caught in an extraordinary circumstance, had the nerve to ask him one simple question. Hey Michael, got any plans for your shoes after the game? The defense, the jumper, net. Then he staggers back to the bench, near exhaustion, ready to fall over. They put the ice bag on his neck. He won't even take the Gatorade. He doesn't want to waste any energy. The Bulls won that game and then took the championship. And as promised, MJ signed the shoes and gave them to Truman. 16 years later, in December 2013, the infamous flu game Air Jordan 12s sold for $104,000 at auction. First and third, two out. In 1998, Mark McGuire broke the then single-season home run record with this hit, and the game ball that met the swing sold at auction for $2.6 million. Todd McFarlane was the buyer. The entrepreneur and creator of Spawn also purchased Sammy Sosa's 66th home run baseball for $175,000 that same year. In 2003, he rounded out the trinity of his collection with the addition of Barry Bonds' 73rd home run ball for 517 grand. Three baseballs, three million dollars. But if you know anything about these guys... June 2014. Stuart Weitzman, world-renowned shoe designer and entrepreneur, purchased the fabled British Guiana one-cent stamp for 9.7 million dollars at auction. Measuring in at 0.04 grams, it has been quoted as the most valuable item in the world by weight. For three years between 2015 and 2018, it was on display in the Smithsonian giving the public access for the first time to one of the rarest collectible curiosities in history. And I love geography, so it, it provided a bit of an education, a lot of fun. Uh, it was a childhood thing. You know, I eventually gave it up. You thought you gave it up. Well, yeah. <laughs> in May of 2016, another beloved stamp hit the public market. Inverted Jennies have always been coveted, but this one in particular sold for $1.3 million in New York to a private collector. Just another day at the lot. This is the Jenny Invert plate number block. It's uh, about, worth about $3 million. It, uh... $3 million. Narrowing in on geek culture provides similar stories. Action Comics number one, the book that debuted Superman to the 1938 depression ridden the United States and introduced the concept of superheroes to the world in the process, is comics version of the inverted Jenny. Its most pristine copy was preserved like a mummy in a dark and humid cabin, in the mountains of West Virginia for decades until it hit eBay in 2014. Final selling price, $3.2 million. In the world of collectible trading cards, there are a few names that move through hobby circles like urban legends around campfire. For those steeped in baseball cards, everyone knows the myth of the Gretzky T206 Honus Wagner. Already an extremely rare card by all measures, this one has a history all its own. As the story goes, the first recorded transaction occurred between Alan Ray and Bill Mastro, who then quickly flips the card for four times his investment to buyer Jim Copeland. Copeland then sold the card to hockey legend Wayne Gretzky and LA Kings owner Bruce McNall in 1991 for $451,000. The high-profile figures brought with them sharp eyes and skeptics who noticed the card's unusual outer shape leading to the eventual trial of Bill Mastro for having altered the edges to increase its commercial appeal. Bill Mastro cut the edges of that card with a paper cutter to make it look more pristine, to make it look better, and then sold the card, uh, or was involved in the sale of that card numerous times without disclosing to anybody in the market that he had manipulated the card. In 2013, Mastro confessed in federal court to trimming the T206 Honus Wagner, then later served time in prison for utilizing shill bidding schemes in his auctions for other memorabilia. 
After Gretzky, though, the Wagner moved through a few hands, eventually ending up in the collection of Arizona Diamondbacks owner Ken Kendrick for the hefty cost of $2.8 million. He still has the card. T206 Honus Wagner equivalents are present in the three most popular trading card games, but they have yet to match such a commanding price tag. In Yu-Gi-Oh!, the tournament Black Luster Soldier is rumored to be valued in the millions. This card is a one-of-a-kind print on stainless steel and was awarded to the winner of the game's very first tournament in Japan back in 1999. Until it sells, though, that price is just a number. Pokemon's version of Honus Wagner has certainly sold, however. In 2017, a first edition Shadowless and Holographic Charizard sold on eBay for $55,000. The card sported a perfect 10 from Beckett Grading Services, a company that upholds the toughest criteria in the business, and carried that pristine rating all the way to the bank. Sidewalk kids from the 90s are perhaps now receiving their very first big payday when it comes to collectible cards. And for those of us deeply invested in the world of Magic the Gathering, we have... <gasps> Holy bitch! Holy... Oh my god! <laughs> Holy crap! That shouldn't happen! You're really looking back into the early 90s and uh, a somewhat different gaming landscape to today's, of course. There's a card which is perhaps the most fabled in the game, which is called the Black Lotus. In 1993, when Magic hit West Coast gaming shelves for the first time, breaking new design territory and revolutionizing the market in the process, I didn't yet know how to read. Twenty years later, and just before graduating college, I found the game that had since become a global phenomenon. Not long after learning the rules and playing a few matches, I asked the question that perhaps everyone does at some point near the beginning. What is the most powerful card in the game? Well, it's this one. The Black Lotus. In a world of hungering hydras, savvy wizards, menacing dragons, and mind control, you mean to tell me a flower in a field is the kingpin? The short answer is yes, absolutely, and the reasons for which are at the center of this study. First, I'd like to contextualize this card for those unfamiliar. Black Lotus is the centerpiece to a collection of cards nicknamed the Power Nine, all having been banned or restricted in every playable format except for one, and all of which come from the game's debut set, when designers were still learning how to balance every tiny moving part. The other eight members of this group are, if you'll indulge me a little bit, <clears throat> Ancestral Recall, a blue spell that grants high card advantage at too little a cost. Time Walk, another blue card that lets players take extra turns and advance their resources while their opponent twiddles their thumbs. Time Twister, a third blue card and the weakest of the nine, which resets resources and exploits other card drawing effects. Then the five Moxen. Pearl, Sapphire, Jet, Ruby, and Emerald. Black Lotus does what these five do, but better. Much better. In a turn-based game driven entirely by cost and effect, these artifacts provide players extra advantage with virtually no drawback. And since, unlike their blue affiliates, they could be included in any deck, anyone who chose not to was bringing checkers to a chess match. After its monumental debut in 1993, game creator Dr. Richard Garfield and his designers were facing two unforeseen issues for Magic. The first and most pressing, they did not expect the Power 9 to show up in high quantities in individual decks. When they sat down to playtest the game, Richard Garfield and his friends at the, in the maths department of the University of uh, Pennsylvania, they tried to simulate what it would be like uh, for, for, for people to be playing this game in real life. So they printed up on a, you know, very rudimentary, uh, on a photocopier, made, made a, a number of copies of the cards and sort of mixed them all up in a big bin bag and doled them out to the playtesters. And they were thinking, well, you know, once this game comes out, maybe people will buy one deck of cards, you know, one deck of cards and maybe a few supplementary cards and that'll be what they're playing with. Um, so they'd underestimated the power of a, a lot of these cards in the game, including this fabled Power 9, which are today worth a, a lot of money. The second issue was a direct result of the first. Players wanted power, but faced very scarce supply. Both Alpha and Beta, the first two Magic base sets, sold out almost immediately after printing. 
So in response to immense demand, Wizards ran a third print run of the same cards from Beta and called the expansion Unlimited. To keep collectors happy, Unlimited had white bordered cards, as opposed to Alpha and Beta's black borders, and sought to saturate the market in order to give players a better chance of finding cards like the Black Lotus. But in March of 1994, only four months after its release, Unlimited sold out too. To put this in perspective, here are the numbers. The Alpha print run made 2.6 million cards. Beta printed 7.3 million. Unlimited, despite its name, tripled the quantity of the first two sets combined and printed over 35 million cards. All 45 million cards were sold out five months before Magic's first anniversary. And in these three sets alone were the only physical copies of the Power 9. In other words, every tournament legal Black Lotus in existence was printed in 1993 and never again. Writer Chaz Andres broke these numbers down even further in his article All About Alpha from 2012 in order to better pinpoint the total number of first edition lotuses we have. He writes, Alpha contained 295 cards. The print run for each rare in Alpha was just 1100, meaning all of the Alpha Black Lotuses to ever exist could fit inside a single long box. Here comes the first Alpha rare. At 8 minutes in, will it be the Lotus? Now, you may be asking, why not print more Lotuses? Of the 79 expansions, 18 core sets, and myriad supplemental products across the game's 25-year lifespan, why has the Power 9 only shown up in three sets? Well, this is the part of the story that gets very, very tricky. Rewind the clocks back again to 1995. Magic is doing extremely well, and part of the reason for its success is because of powerful cards like Black Lotus gaining monetary and nostalgic value in the secondary market. Not only was the game engaging enough to keep players highly invested, but collectability began to take shape in the community as it had done in baseball cards and the like. And now we see a tropical island, and now we see Justin fanning out his eight cards, playing a sulfurous spring, and a... oh my, it looks like a Black Lotus! In July 1995, Wizards released Chronicles, which was an extension of the 4th edition core set and introduced zero new cards to the game. Its function was purely to meet the high demand and low supply crisis that had been plaguing Magic since its inception. It sought to put booster packs in the hands of players who couldn't buy cards in sold out game stores. But unlike Unlimited, it was printed into the ground, adding 180 million cards to the markets and resulting in many of the game's most prized possessions to lose nearly all their value overnight. Collectors put forth a rebuttal and advocated for a better reprint policy moving forward. So in May of the following year, published first in the Duelist magazine issue number 10, Wizards of the Coast responded to the resistance with the installment of the reserved list. We have decided to expand on our previous policies by creating a new category of cards, called the reserved list, that will never be printed again in black or white border in game functionally identical form. On this list was the Black Lotus. In its infancy, the reserved list was well received and celebrated by players. The cards on the list were safe from reprints, which meant they naturally had the potential to appreciate in value as the game grew in popularity. And at that time, supplemental sets did not yet exist, so strong cards like the Power 9 already had virtually no chance to see reprints in tournament legal expansions. The reserved list at first acted as the perfect middle ground between providing for players and appeasing collectors. Since then, it has become the central target of all disdain for critics of inflated prices of old school magic cards. And like many folks, if given the choice, Mark Rosewater would never have implemented the list in the first place. Regardless, it exists, and for the most part has remained intact since May of 1996. A pair of revisions have taken place, resulting in a handful of classic cards like Demonic Tutor and Clone being removed from the list in 2002. In 2010, Wizards experimented with reprinting a few reserved list cards in foil, toying with a loophole that claimed the original decree never stated against the publishing of premium versions. Players backlashed, claiming this violated the spirit of the list, which resulted in Wizards extending the promise to include foil versions of these cards in their no reprint policy. If you could just introduce yourself and what you do in the Magic community, and then we'll go from there. So my name is Douglas Johnson, but everybody calls me DJ. Um, I buy and sell Magic cards for a living. For this video, I wanted to talk to Douglas Johnson for a few reasons. 
the first being to gather his thoughts on the reserved list. I mean, Mark Rosewater, every designer, every person employed at Wizards would probably love for the reserve list to go away, but it's really hard to make that argument to a Hasbro lawyer. I don't think the reserve list can go away. I think it's too late to try to mess with the Jenga blocks. Since reprinting Black Lotus is out of the question, given its place on the reserved list, why not just abandon the policy altogether? If Magic's lead designer and foremost figure in R&D wants it gone, what's stopping the company from making another revision like they've done in the past and simply removing all the cards from the list? Again, this part is very tricky, and like DJ said, it's a matter of the law. Luckily, we have some brilliant people who play Magic and can theorize about the ramifications of abolishing the reserved list. Scott Peitzer, an attorney with interest in contract law, is one such figure. In June 2018, he published the first installment in a series of articles called Contract from Below on MTG Goldfish, in which he details the principle of promissory estoppel and how it applies to this situation. First and foremost, Peitzer outlines the anatomy of a contract, claiming that Wizard's article in the Duelist magazine never possessed consideration, one of a contract's three core elements. As such, Despite the reserved list being a promise to players, it is not legally a contract, and therefore not enforceable by law. The caveat, of course, is promissory estoppel, which essentially gives a judge discretion to enforce the promise as if it were a contract. In theory, a player could sue wizards for promissory estoppel if they reprinted Black Lotus, but they would have to prove that the case possessed all the elements required for promissory estoppel, and furthermore would potentially only receive the difference between the price paid and the fair market value after reprints. For example, if I bought Black Lotus for $3,000 and the price tanked to $1,000 because of a reprint, I could only sue for two grand and not for the value I expected from investment. And once again, the repayments of such damages are ultimately at the discretion of the judge. And there are a lot more details that Scott will get into. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and so I have nothing more to say with regards to the court. I'll leave that to Peitzer's future articles. So to recap, of the nine most powerful cards in the game, Black Lotus is the centerpiece. Moreover, it was only ever printed in three sets back in 1993 and can never be printed again because of an old promise that the makers of the game have since regretted. As a result of these three elements, Black Lotus has evolved from just another cut of cardstock into the most desirable item in the history of magic. My name is Zakiel Gordon. I'm a product data professional and collectible entrepreneur. As I went further down the rabbit hole into the world of collector's goods, I wanted to know who was buying and selling Black Lotuses. So I called up my good friend Zakiel to talk. Flashback to my local game store, I remember walking in when they give you the, you know, the 30 card sample decks. Um, and at the same time, you can look in the glass case and you see all the cards. And I remember specifically seeing Black Lotus, Mox Chet, even the Dual Lands, and realizing like, holy cow, this game is everything that all these other secondary markets are, um, but more. I also wanted the perspective of a seller. Enter again Douglas Johnson. I guess the, the backstory to this entire story itself is that a close friend of mine came across a collection that was basically the holy grail. It was the collection that everybody dreams about or that friends lie to their friends about finding at a yard sale or whatever. The kind of collection where somebody used a volcanic island as a bookmark for Aragon, that kind of thing. Back when kids were using magic cards to keep their pages in fantasy novels, Lotus was less than a hundred bucks. By 2002, according to Scry Magazine, an Alpha Lotus hovered around $500. Eleven years later, in 2013, the auction for the same card commanded an asking price of $27,000. Now, Zakiel and DJ weren't dealing with the first edition near mint alphas, but the cost of beta and unlimited copies were still in the thousands at the time of their purchases and have only gone up since. Zakiel's first Lotus was one of the latter. I knew someone was selling one, and I believe at the time it was for a total of $1,700, and I made him an offer, and I said, you know, if I'm going to do this, this is not only going to be for my cube and for my collection, but this is going to be my dedication to the to the best game ever made. Uh, so I bought that for my cube, uh, and then suddenly I became the guy. 
I drove up to meet him at his place, and I brought a loop. I brought a friend who could also help verify the authenticity of the card. It was a very good condition, unlimited Lotus, that I purchased last year for a little over $3,000. For trading cards of this value, authenticity and quality are key. Counterfeits have always threatened the former, and so buyers and sellers must know how to verify that these cards came from the presses of 1993 and nowhere else. To do so, there are a few methods to confirm the card is not a fake. The first is a bit tough to watch. Known as the bend test, this technique tries the integrity of the materials inside. Fakes will crease and wrinkle at the fold, but authentic cards like Sakil's first lotus here will show nothing of the sort. Touches? It does bend, but there is no crease, which is the important thing that we're looking for. Secondly, like DJ said, a jeweler's loop can pick out inconsistent ink patterns on false cards. This video from Kingslayer Games in California shows us the rosettes a real card should possess, and then how they appear on fake pieces of Unlimited. The set symbols and then also the text on cards is going to be a second layer of ink on top of the other ink. So rosettes underneath, black ink on top. Real. We've got um, nice rosettes on the blue part of the card, and the ink pattern um, is recognizable to other authentic cards for the rest of it. And fake. If it was authentic, would be just flat black printed right on top of the card, which it is clearly not. A real text box on an unlimited lightning bolt. And same thing, awesome. So we've got the rosette patterns make a whole lot of sense for how these cards are printed. And then the black ink for the text of the, the card as well is printed, as you can tell, it just kind of floats above the other layer of ink. And the text box on a fake unlimited black lotus. See so yeah, how that black ink should be right above the other ink, and it's clearly not. The light test is another bar to hurdle. Here's a video from Christopher Lamb showing a fake signed Lotus through the light of his cell phone. As opposed to a real magic card, the counterfeit one has blotchy, inconsistent ink patterns throughout the core of the card. And you can see that it's just uneven, totally off. And that explains why the card did not feel real to me. The final way to verify authenticity is by sending the card to a grading service. As of now, the two leading names in the business are Professional Sports Authenticator, PSA for short, and BGS, known better as Beckett. After buying a Black Lotus, DJ sent his to the latter, which, like I said earlier, holds their grades to higher criteria. As somebody who had never dealt in a X thousand dollar card before, I messaged a couple of friends of mine who deal with it regularly. I sent them very high-end scans of the card, and one of those people just said, hey, I think this is a good enough condition card. I think that the risk is good enough to get it graded and send it in for grading. If it comes back as an 8.5, you're looking at an extra like 500 to a thousand dollars. If it comes back as a nine, you're looking at an extra two or three thousand dollars. This could be really good for you. Little did DJ know, the card was in almost perfect condition. I got an email first that said what the uh, grade was, and I thought it was incorrect, and I thought it must have been wrong, and then I got it back in the mail, and it was a 9.5. And that was definitely the best case scenario, because it added several thousand dollars just to this de single half decimal point, just adds a significant amount of value to it. A 9.5 is a godsend for sellers and collectors. But Zakiel wasn't looking to encase his lotus in a plastic slab and lock it away in a safe deposit box. He wanted to use his for his cube. After playing for a while, I made the firm commitment, you know, I want to make a cube because I know with regards to my career progression, I'm not going to have as much time as I would like to later. And my cube is essentially what I call the Museum of Magic. So it has black lotus, it has test prints, it has alpha and beta cards, it has new cards, and it really kind of encapsulates, I think, what the game is and its core function. And cube is just really a testament to that as a format. Nonetheless, the piece held much more value than simply its place in the cube. There's some form of validation as a Magic player to reach, to climb Everest, to reach the top and to have this card in your hand. Uh, I remember buying it and just looking at it in my car for like a half an hour being like, holy cow, <laughs> I can't believe I actually own a Black Lotus. Um, if you look at the video, you can see as I, I'm like walking in the, in the garage and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like I can't stop smiling. In October 2017, the YouTuber Open Boosters took a beta pack from 1993 and found the same card that Zakiel purchased at Grand Prix Seattle. The most significant difference between the two cards, however, was what DJ alluded to in regards to quality. 
Zakiel's Lotus, considered lightly played, was purchased in 2018 for six thousand dollars. This one. Oh, holy shit! shit. <laughs> this one is a BGS 9.5 Beta Black Lotus. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! And this one. Here comes the first alpha rare. Will it be the Lotus? From the video that made national headlines, breaking through gaming circles and drawing the attention of all sorts of people who simply did not understand the gravity of the event. Holy bitch! Or perhaps just chose to lean into their prejudices and dismiss it. This is a 9.5 Alpha Black Lotus, one of only 1,100 ever made in the world. <laughs> Now I suppose we could give the critics the benefit of the doubt. I suppose we could choose to be cynical and laugh at the gloves, and his reaction, and the idea of collectibles as a whole. After all, it's just another piece of cardboard. These are just shoes, and these three are the top three home run balls in Major League history right here. 66, 70, 73. Those are just baseballs, and we're here this afternoon to dedicate a new version the most famous stamp in American history. Hell, all these are just decorated pieces of paper. At the end of the day, they're nothing more than the value we've agreed to give to them. Unlike food, water, a home, they're entirely unessential. In economics, they'd call the Black Lotus a Veblen good. But to me, I see a common thread across all these hobbies and interests that reveals the very human tendency to collect things. Long before the internet, long before photography, travelers would seek and gather trinkets, paintings, and even animal skeletons to curate them into an exhibit. They were known as cabinets of curiosities, and their function, apart from simply signaling social status, was to instill wonder into the minds of those who passed through the room. More than a museum, cabinets of curiosities were mechanisms of turning seemingly mundane objects into depositories of intrigue. They were locales for the imagination. And it didn't matter if the truth was stretched in the process. What counted was the story an object could provide. But that's the good thing about these collections of curiosities, isn't it? Each object has to have a story. Yeah. And I don't know if we sometimes wonder or does it even matter whether it's true or not? I don't think it does, does it? I mean, it's it's what's been invested in that object, isn't it? It's what it's been charged with. It's mm. kind of a, a narrative. I, you know, sneakers, magic cards, even to a lesser extent, paintings, comics, art, um, high-end luxury clothing, they all have the same core values, right? They're all luxury goods with perceived value. Uh, which are worth a lot to some and a lot less to others. We are in magic and obviously Black Lotus is this transcendent piece um, you know, a, 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 that represents so much to us, but at the end of the day, it's still a piece of cardboard. I mean, Black Lotus is the crown jewel of magic. And so there will always be people willing to spend money on Black Lotus, regardless of what the new price is and how quickly it goes up. The things that stay constant in these collectible markets is, is the item desirable and then in addition to that, does it transcend what it was originally supposed to do? In July of 2018, the Black Lotus made headlines once again. One of the 1,100 copies from Alpha, with a grade of 9.5 from BGS, sold at auction for $87,000. A curiosity indeed. Thank you for watching. huge huge thank you to Titus Chalk for letting me use the sound clips from the interview um, I will have the link to that interview below it's very very good it's a very in-depth interview and obviously my two guests for this episode Zakiel Gordon and DJ Douglas Johnson Douglas Johnson is a podcaster and host of the Brainstorm Brewery podcast one of my absolute favorites of all time I think I'm like the biggest Brainstorm Brewery fan out there and, um, and Zakiel Gordon is a longtime friend just through YouTube. Uh, I went out to Seattle and I met him in person and he took me out to pizza and beer and we had some good talks. And um, he was super on board to help me with the Lotus video. So please reach out to those folks, tell them thank you and, um, and that you appreciate their contributions because they're, they're great people. Um, also, this episode is dedicated to all my uh, all my patrons. Every patron that I have is going to be listed in the credits for this episode just because it was such a monster to make. It's like the longest I've ever spent on any video. And people um, 
you know, people when they pledge a certain amount of money to you, they kind of want to see you produce content. And, uh, and I basically <laughs> have been kind of holding them out to dry all summer as I've been making a, a couple of uh, smaller projects, but this one took like three months to make. So thank you so much for being patient with me and believing in the work and the process. So this one's for you guys. Uh, last but not least, of course, my I partnership I have a partnership with CardKingdom.com. So if you want to buy singles and get them super fast uh, for your commander decks or whatever, CardKingdom.com slash studies. If you would like to join the Patreon page too, that'd be super cool. <laughs> if you enjoyed the video and want to see more of it. Okay, so thank you so much to everyone who has helped with this project. It felt really, really good to do it. It's due service and I had, you know, I had a lot of time during the summer to, to do that. So cheers everybody, shout out to Black Lotus, shout out to Good Coffee, Black Coffee. Alright, thanks for watching.